Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This talk is brought to you by Ion Connect. This state-of-the-art co-working space and tech lab helps grow innovative ideas from applied research and development, testing and engineering qualification, to commercialization and market launch. Our speaker this evening is Earl Flormata. Earl is one of the most sought after digital marketing and sales consultants in Vancouver. He is famous for ranking business and people on Google and has sold over $70 million worth of products and services, both on and offline. Vancouver Business Network members and most welcome guests, let's give Earl Flamada the, the warm, warm, rousing welcome that he deserves. Hi everyone, thank you all for coming tonight. I know you had a decision with whether you wanted to go out to the beach and hang out in the nice warm sun or come learn about outsourcing today. So thank you for those who decided to come learn about outsourcing. Uh, what's gonna happen is that uh, if you learn how to use outsourcing properly, you'll be able to go to the beach a whole lot more in different countries, uh, I guess at the time of your own choosing. So, all right, we're gonna get started. So I, I, I called this workshop the, the 25th hour, right? And it's how to find how to get more out of a day than you even thought possible. And you do that obviously by outsourcing. That's what the whole topic of the, today's talk is. And so the agenda we're gonna cover is a couple of, a couple of things. Uh, first thing we're gonna cover is definitions of value and time. Right? That's the, the first thing we have to talk about because um, a lot of you talked about you know, being able to outsource people to trust and uh, finding out can I do this? Um, the answer is oh yes. Uh, next thing is leverage, right? Being able to trust that you can leverage other people, other people's time, other people's skills. Then procedures and systems, moving on to best practices, and then um, at the end is an offer. Okay. So you're supposed to start off presentation with some sort of hard hitting, you know, crazy thing that gets everyone's attention. And the best I could come up with for this particular subject was time is the only gold. Time is the only gold, right? It's the only thing you have a finite amount of. Okay. What's your time worth? Okay. So when people are talking about um, growing their business and doing all that sort of thing, most people don't think that they're going to spend all their time working, right? You're going to spend all your time in your business and you're never going to get to see the beach, you're never going to see your family, you're never going to go to Disneyland, all those types of things. That whole thing around time is your only goal, time is the only goal is the truth, right? I mean, that's, that's really the only thing that we have that, that's worth something. People have this kind of time wage mentality when they go, you know what, I make $35 an hour, I make $100 an hour, I make $500 an hour, great. But in a time wage mentality, you're always trading time for money, okay? You wanna be trading value for money. I'll say it again, you wanna trade value for money because value can be worth a whole lot more than whatever you charge per hour, okay? So time equals money, we've heard that before. It's a fallacy, it's a hoax, it's a bold-faced lie, okay? Time is definitely not money, right? Time is money. If you are an employee and you work for someone else and you get paid an hourly wage, you get paid a salary, that makes absolute sense. Time is money then, okay? But when you guys are entrepreneurs, I mean, this is the, the workshop and this is the group for entrepreneurs and business owners and that sort of thing, time is no longer money, okay? Time is the thing you have to defend with everything you have, okay? Because you can't be working all the time, otherwise you will go a little crazy. So you need to learn how to use leverage. And leverage is that scary word that people are like, well, yeah, I don't really want to use leverage. It's other people's money, OPM. Other people's time, OPT, OPK, other people's knowledge, all right? And in the world of outsourcing, we're gonna use only a couple of these things, actually, okay? Outsourcing is other people's time plus other people's knowledge plus your systems. I'll say it again, other people's time plus other people's knowledge plus your systems. And this is the number one reason people fail in outsourcing. So just to give you some background in outsourcing for what I've done, I've managed teams of 300 in outsourcing. That sounds a little crazy. And it is a little crazy. Don't manage 300 people ever, just saying. Never do that, okay? Yeah. I thought I was hot stuff, I can, I can, I can manage 300 people, don't do it, okay? Uh, I thought I was hot stuff, I, I, you could hire 100 people, make them go, don't do it, right? Make hierarchies, make structure, okay? That's the first thing. Now, when I say other people's time, other people's knowledge, plus your systems, there were a lot of people here who talked about, can I trust the people I'm about to hire? Can I trust that they're gonna do a good job? Can I trust that they're going to do it the way I would have done it? 
Can I trust the way that they're going to do it you know, for the company? And here's my answer to those questions around trust. Don't trust anybody. Okay, everyone's like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, and you're like, what the hell? And like, no, no, I'm serious. Do not trust anybody. I'm not joking. And this is the secret to success in outsourcing. This is the secret to success in doing that. If you're gonna outsource something, outsource something that you kind of understand. You have to have a basic understanding of whatever you're about to outsource. Okay, that goes against the grain of a lot, a lot of people think outsourcing is. They go, well, outsource the stuff you don't know how to do. No, do not outsource the stuff you don't know how to do. Hire for the stuff you don't know how to do. Okay, hire here, locally, for stuff you don't know how to do. How come? The communication breakdowns for stuff you don't know how to do need to be handled in person. Need to be handled face to face. Something close by. Okay? Never outsource your weaknesses. I'll say it again. Never outsource your weaknesses. Outsource your strengths that you hate doing. Okay? Outsource the strengths that you hate doing. Okay? I am good at coding. At least I used to be good at coding 10 years ago. Okay? I outsource it now. What happened? Well, it changed from being Earl the contributor to Earl the manager. Now, what can, I, what can I do with that? Well, now I can manage 100 coders. How come? Because I know coding. Can I check if they did it right? Of course I can. Here's the weird thing. This, this is a lesson that took me forever to learn. Be OK with 80%. Be OK with 80%. If someone can do something 80% as good as you can, thank you, lucky stars. How come? It only takes you 20% to get it all the way to the finish line. And that's where you should start. 80% is good enough. Okay, that's the first thing. So basic understanding, just covering the basics. Only outsource what you know. Only outsource what you know. Hire for whatever you don't know. Okay. So the first thing we're gonna do is this. Time blocking. What the hell does it have to do with outsourcing? Everything. Okay. Most people, if I ask you, what did you get done in the day? What did you get done in the week? What did you get done in the month? Well, I look at a notebook, I have no idea. I'm the same way, I have no idea. I whip open my calendar and I actually look and I can see every hour of every minute of every day is blocked off. Okay, now this might sound cold, but I, I, I book everything, right? Wife wants to go out on a date, book it. Not joking. Kids wanna go play, book it. How come? I can then focus on whatever the task at hand is supposed to be. I don't have to worry, okay? So I'm focusing on the task at hand. I'm focusing on what I'm supposed to be. People want, you gotta be present in wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Time block it, then you know what you're doing. Then you can look back and go, hey, what'd I get done today? Okay. There's a funny meme that's going out there. And the meme says, okay, there's, there's two lists. You have the, the first list is make a list of what makes you happy. Then make a list of what you actually gotta do all day. Then adjust accordingly. Okay. And that's really what you're supposed to be doing when time blocking. Figure out what it is you do all day. What is it you do all day? Most people can't answer that question. I can to the, to the nth degree, the minute. I can tell you, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. What got done? This, this, and this. If it doesn't get done, delete it off your calendar. Reschedule it. Do it later. Everyone follow. So this is the first step in outsourcing. Uh, sounds crazy. When do we hire people? You don't. Okay. Find out what it is that you do all day. Now there's four quadrants I want to kind of picture who you are and what you do. If you're making under or over six figures, okay? So if you're making under $100,000, there's, there's one set of stuff you need to do. If you're making over $100,000, there's a whole other set of stuff you have to do. And it's following the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle, okay? So money now, money later, okay? If you're making less than $100,000, you should be focusing on making money now in your business. If you're making over $100,000, you can focus on the bigger plays, the bigger deals, money later. Okay. Can I, can I put some effort into something where I just get stock as pay? Well, yeah, you can do that later after you've got the nut covered. Can you do it before you're making 100 grand? No. Can you do it after? Of course you can. Then it's your choice. Then it doesn't matter. You're not going to starve to death. Okay. Lead generation? Should I be building leads or should I be building a platform? Should be running around doing speaking gigs, writing books, 
doing all that sort of thing? Yes, after 100,000. Before 100,000? Lead generation. How come? That leads to money now. This is your decision-making process. Okay. So, 80-20 rule. 80% of the time, if you're making under 100 grand, money now. 20% of the time, money later. Once you go over, you flip it over. Now you do it the other way around. You can work on big money plays and not worry so much about money now because you've got a system in place and you've got people working in those systems. So we talked about time blocking. Now it's prioritization. Okay, Make a list of the stuff that you do, then put it in order of stuff that you hate. Okay, What do you not like doing? Okay, I'm an SEO. Okay, I, I, That stands for Search Engine Optimization, or Search Engine Optimizer. Great! I hate looking at spreadsheets. What do you think what SEOs do all day? Look at spreadsheets. Guess what I don't do all day? Look at spreadsheets. I make my team do it. They give me the result of all the digging and I extrapolate from that result. Okay, so you prioritize. Again, let's go back, time block. Okay, decide or write down what you do and document it. Then decide what should you be working on. If you're not spending your time on the right things, adjust accordingly. Once you're spending your time on the right things, prioritize based on what makes you happy and what makes you not happy. Okay. Don't settle for things. Okay. If something if something just you do and it's, it's something that has to be done, but it drives you up the wall and makes you go crazy, this is this is how come people procrastinate. Right? You run into this thing that you hate doing. Well, I gotta do sales. I love doing the first call, but I hate doing the follow-ups. What get the fortunes in the follow-up? If you don't do the follow-up, what's gonna happen? not going to make any money. But if I get my team to follow up, all of a sudden, there's money. Oh, look at that. And that goes back to that rule of money now. Okay. So the next step after that is building standard operational procedures and manuals. Building your systems. Okay. Who here has been to McDonald's? Yeah? Of course. Everybody? Here. Who's been to McDonald's in multiple countries? Yeah, a couple people. Do the French fries taste the same? Do the Big Mac taste the same? It's weird, right? It's exactly the same everywhere you go. Philippines is a little weird. They have like rice burger. But that's that's strange. But uh, but everywhere you go, it's the same thing. How come? Consistency. They've got consistency. They've got systems. They've got manuals and standard operational procedures. Guys, McDonald's has an instruction manual on how to wash your hands, right? And that's how come I'm telling you guys, you don't have to trust anything. You don't have to trust anything. You build the trust through your standard operational procedures and your manuals. Okay. How to hire. This is a fun one. So there's a couple columns, skill and will. Okay. A, B, C, and D. All right. So the A's have skill and will. The D's have no skill and no will. Okay. The B's have no skill, but they're willing. The C's have lots of skill, but they're not willing. Who do you hire? A. A. B. Everyone says A? B. B. Yeah, you're right. B's. You hire the B's. How come? A few people here were saying, well, it might be too expensive. Who do you think the most expensive person on his list is? A. A's. A's. Why? They have... And start their own business. Yeah, exactly. Great! I just spent all this time teaching that one person and then they leave and then, great. And now they're my competitor, right? Don't hire A's. Number one, they're expensive. Number two, they have an ego the size of the room, right? They can't fit their head through the door, right? Never hire A's, okay? They're crazy, they're, they're hard to deal with, okay? Never hire D's, they're useless. Okay, no skill, no will, why? <laughs> right, why am I even talking to you? No. After the interview process, out. <laughs> That's it. Okay. So A is too expensive and has an ego. D is useless. C is burnt out and not coachable. That's another one of those trust things you guys are talking about. Can I trust these people to represent the company well? Can I trust them to do things properly? Can I trust them to do things right? If they're not coachable, what do you think? The answer is probably not. Okay. So Bs are the perfect hire. You can train skill. Skill is teachable. Okay? 
you can train Will, but it takes a long time. So unless they're family or a loved one or a really good friend, there's only so much time in the world and I can't save everybody. Okay? So if they're not, if they don't already have that strong um, willpower, that strong want to do things, the coachability aspect, guess what? I don't want to hire them. Okay? So when I launched my SEO company quite a few years back, uh, I was looking for an, a new web developer. And the web developer had to have this exact same pattern. I wanted the willpower, but they didn't necessarily have the skill. I could teach them the skill on how to rank for stuff on the internet. It's not hard, but they had to be willing to do so. So this is what I did. I asked people, uh, the people I was interviewing, hey, do you know what a schema tag is? Most of them had no idea what the hell a schema tag was. Unless you're doing a lot of SEO work, you have no idea what a schema tag is. So during the interview, I said, great, you don't know what a schema tag is. Here's information on schema tags. They looked it up. Do you guys have a website? Yeah, I have a website. Of course they do. If you don't have a website, no, the interview is over, right? You're a web developer. That's your job, right? So, so if you have a website, great. Can you add a schema tag to the website for me right now? And they're like, wait, what? Now? During the interview. Right now. Out of 10 people, one guy did it. Guess who I heard on the spot for his asking rate? Didn't negotiate, didn't, no, no. Yeah, I found the guy who had the will, but not the skill. Guess what he learned on the spot? The skill. Now he has the skill. Guess what? I have an A for cheap. <laughs> okay. You can grow your own A's. Okay. And you grow them by that procedural manual. You grow them by testing, do they have the will to do this? And then you hire them, and then you train them the skill that you want them to have. It's much better if they actually have zero skill because then they're, you're, they're learning from zero. They don't have to go from negative three. Like let's pretend somebody, you're hiring somebody and you're, you have a very specific work, you have a very specific job, okay? If you're hiring them and they already have a bunch of experience, how much of that experience is relevant? How much of the experience doesn't work anymore? How much of the experience, yeah, with SEO as an example, stuff that worked last year might not work this year. Guess what? I have 10 years of experience. Good for you. That's not, I, I don't want you. Right now you have 10 years of bad habits. I have to rewind and fix and relearn. Right? I'd rather teach someone from zero. Any questions on that? Any questions on the chart so far? Yeah. How do you find those people? So I'll repeat the question. How do you find those people? You interview a bunch and you test them all. You interview a bunch and you test them all. I'll actually get back to that. I'll get back to that. There's actually a, a, a process by which you do that. Would you be ready to outsource the hiring process? Would you be ready to outsource the hiring process is the question. The answer is yes. And the answer goes back to, do you have a standard operational procedure? <laughs> do you have a manual for the hiring process? Okay. If you don't, you might want to consider that. Okay. So this is the answer to your question. You hire three. You test all three, you keep one. Okay? This is your very own reality TV show. You're fired, you're fired. Keep you. Okay? So you hire three, you test three, you keep one. Okay? And you pay them for the hired test. You pay them. Guys, we're going to hire you on, on, the, on the condition that you can follow instructions. Can you follow instructions? Just make sure that they can follow instructions, otherwise don't hire them, okay? Then you ask a bunch of personality type questions to see, do you fit with them? Do you like working with this person? Yes or no? If the answer is no, next, find another one. Keep doing this until you find three people you wanna work with. When you've got those three people, pay them to accomplish a task. What's the task? Doesn't matter, as long as you have a standard operation procedure and a manual. Okay? You've got the, the SOP in the manual, you test them, you pay them, and you just ask the one that you like most to come back. Stick around. Do it again. Okay? So real tasks, real tests, real pay. I know it sounds crazy. You're like, well, Earl, why, how come I would pay this three people to do the exact same task? It's much cheaper than recruiting. How much does outsourcers cost? Three, four dollars an hour? Three percent of the person's annual salary. Oh, for recruiting. So someone was saying, yeah, three percent of the person's annual salary is what it costs, is 30 percent, 20 percent. 20 percent of their annual salary is what it costs to hire somebody. That's, yeah. That's 
Yeah, exactly. That is standard. <clears throat> Guess what? I don't do that. I do that when I have to hire somebody. When I'm going to outsource something, I do this. Okay. Then you get to test them for real. See how they work under fire. Okay. Get a real chance to really get to know them. Some people were saying, um, I think it was a Brazilian fellow saying they have to wear the company shirt. Right? Check. Right? Give them the chance to wear the company shirt. See if it works. And if it works, great. Keep them. If it doesn't work, well, you got paid work out of them. You can actually see it. The other beautiful thing about this is it tests your manuals and procedures. When you do this and you hire them and you give them the work, how many questions do they come back with? When they, when they come back with questions, are the questions smart or dumb? If the questions are dumb, that's your fault. How come? Your manual sucks. Right? Your manual has to be like you're building it for a five-year-old. It has to be click this button, then this button, then this button. Okay? My manuals have very large arrows pointing to very large buttons with very large red circles around them. If you can't follow this, I'm sorry, you're fired. <laughs> right? So that, that's really what it's all about, building the standard operational procedure, building the manual, building the process, testing are they willing to try the process. Guys, I used to do the SEO for Ford. I used to do the SEO for Chevy, for Nissan, for a bunch of giant companies. And what I did was I took a bunch of interns in. I got the interns to watch a training video. They've never done SEO in their lives. Okay. I get them, watch this training video. It's 35 minutes long. You might have to watch it a couple times. Okay, and they watch it a couple times. Great. Give them access to a test server. Now do it. Then they go and do it. Holy cow, the interns are working. Okay, one day, they're useful. Okay. How come? SOPs and manuals. I'm going to beat this to death. Okay, SOPs and manuals. The strength of your SOPs and manuals are the strength of your hires. Strength of your hires or the strength of your business. If you can scale it, then you win. Question. <clears throat> Would you not do the test during the interview process? So okay. you give each applicant an assignment, come to the interview with this done? I'll, I'll repeat the question. So the question that the, the Roger had was, do you not give the test during the interview? Could you not? Or could you not? Yeah. Um, my answer is no. Most of the time when they're in the interview, they're already nervous enough as it is. Okay, so they're already nervous, they're already freaking out, like, ha oh, he's gonna hire me or not. Yeah, don't give them any more tests. Test, o test only for personality. Test only for personality fit between the two of you. Test only for um, ability for will, right? Test just for those things. The skills can be done after the fact. So skills can always be fixed later. Skills are easy to fix. Skills are easy to show people what to do. Okay. So the next, uh, any more questions on that one part before we move on? You guys can ask, it's cool. How do you test for the will though? How do you test for will? Yeah. That's a really good question. How would you test for will? Anyone have any really good interview questions that you would use to test for willpower? Mm. Uh, speak with them. Like, speak with them. Okay. Saying how they respond to you. Well, yeah, ask questions and see how they respond for sure. But there's there's classical questions that you guys can ask to test for willpower. Okay. Let's let's give an example. Um, let's say you're hiring for management. Give me an example when you put the needs of the group ahead of yourself. Show me that. Okay. Once you do that, and they go, well, this is the one time I did this. Give me another one. Okay, I did like this too. Give me another one. Great. See what they do when you ask the question, so what? I graduated, da 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 da. So what? Oh. <laughs> let's, just, let's just see what, what happens when they're under, under pressure, when they're under fire. Right? Do you want to see how they're going to, would you rather find out while they're working for you in the middle of a giant client project or you want to ask them during an interview? One of those things you probably want to ask during the interview process. Right? So learn the art of interviewing. Okay? It's also really good for interviewing clients. It, w once you get big enough and you can pick and choose your clients, you don't have to say yes to everybody. Okay? Then when you interview the clients, you're also going to have a really good business because you're going to have really good relationships with your clients. You want great clients. You don't want bad clients. Okay? 
Yes. I find it interesting when you work when you're outsourcing, not locally, you're outsourcing to another country. So well, I'll repeat the question. How does interviewing work when you're not in the same country? Uh, you're going to use any sort of messaging system. So you can use Zoom, you can use Skype, you can use uh, Microsoft, uh, anything. You can use Hangouts, pick your poison, they're all the same. right? Uh, typically, I've been using Zoom as of late, uh, only because Zoom seems to be the most stable system across multiple countries. So I actually have uh, an army of 300 developers out of the Ukraine, another army of more developers out of, out of Uruguay, I've got more people out of India, Egypt, everywhere, Philippines, right? It depends where you need the, where we need the skill set. And so, yeah, um, Zoom was the one that was the most prevalent across all the countries, and it was the one that was the most stable. So, so and, and do yourself a favor. If that, this is what you're going to do, go upgrade yourself to a pro Zoom account, because uh, if you don't, the free one only cuts off after 45 minutes and you have to reconnect again. So that is not much fun. So depends how long your meetings are. So the next part we're going to talk about is frameworks. Okay, I'm going to talk about Agile frameworks and top threes. So the first thing we're going to talk about is Agile frameworks. And the Agile framework I like is called Scrum. I told you guys I was a developer. I wasn't kidding. I, I use Scrum or Kanban. Now, there's a really good website out there. You guys are taking notes. It's called scrumtrainingseries.com. Say it again, scrumtrainingseries.com. And the, the funny thing you're going to learn about these, these frameworks is you're not actually going to learn anything new. You're going to learn the right order in which to do things. Okay? You're not going to learn anything new. It's, it's weird. I'm telling you, go learn this, but you're not going to learn anything new. You're going to learn the right order in which to do things. Okay? So it's not the order. So it's the order, it's not the steps. Okay? Everybody knows. Okay, project time. Let's make a list of all the stuff we're going to do. Great. That's part of Scrum too. Great, now let's prioritize things. Wonderful, that's part of Scrum too. Hey, who's working on what? Make a list of that stuff, part of Scrum as well. Do you guys know all of those things already? Of course you do. What order do you do things in? When do you repeat stuff? That's what Scrum's gonna teach you. When to repeat things, how to test for things, how to measure things, are things going okay or not, okay? When you build a bridge, most of the time, you start building the bridge and you pray you hit the other side. Okay. Now, with digital things, it's not necessarily the case. You can start with one iteration and change your mind. Oh, no, change it all. I want it all purple and yellow instead. Okay, great. With Scrum, you're working with things in two-week bite-sized increments. Two weeks. So when you screw up, you can only ever be two weeks off track as opposed to the old method where, see you in six months, you come back, why the hell is it pink? Okay, that's not what I wanted. Okay. That communication system, Scrum is really important for that. The best thing I learned from Scrum was called a daily stand-up. We have daily stand-ups for our company. They last 15 minutes, okay? Everyone shows up. In the daily stand-up, you say three things. What'd you do yesterday? What are you working on today? What's in your way of getting your job done? Those are probably the most important things you need to know in a meeting. Hey, what's everyone doing? What's everyone working on? What's everyone working on today? Are you stuck anywhere? As a business owner, these are probably the most important things that you need to know. And that's how come I use Scrum, Kanban, Agile models. The next thing I want to talk about is the top threes. The human brain can only take three stimuli per second. Okay, You can only think of three things. So if you try to do more than that, you're going to fail. Okay. I'm, I'm a trained martial artist. I have a black belt in Taekwondo, Hapido, Jiu Jitsu, now I do Wing Chun. I'm trained to hit you three times per second. How come? Because your brain shuts down after three per second. The moment you hit four, it's like, ooh, that's it, and you just stop moving. It's crazy. The same thing for the human brain when you're trying to get stuff done. If you're trying to juggle more than three things, guess what? You're not going to make it. Okay. We're all actually really good monotaskers. If you think you're a multitasker, if you're a woman, maybe. Guys, absolutely not, okay? You're just really good at switching monotasking, okay? And there's a, I actually wrote an article about this on LinkedIn, and there's a chemical compound in your brain that actually depletes every single time you change train of thought. 
Every single time you change what you're thinking about, this chemical compound goes down a little bit. Anyone ever have that 3 o'clock, uh, my brain is done today? Yeah, yeah everyone has that yeah. around 3 o'clock? How come? You switch too many things in your head. I stopped having that 3 o'clock freeze moment when I only focused on three things a day. The other thing is that this is consistency. It no longer impresses me that you can get 100 things done in a day. Good for you, but then you're useless for the next two weeks. Why? Because you're dead. Right? I used to think I'm hot stuff. I can get 20 things done. Do that for a couple weeks until burnout, then crash, and then back up and do it again. That's not consistency. That's not reliability. Can you really trust the person who keeps burning out all the time? Not so much. Don't, don't invent yourself more C's. That's not good for you. Okay? What impresses me is consistency. Can you get three things done every day, like clockwork, day in, day out? Yes? then I trust you. Question? Yeah, so for the, for the same thing, yes. um, so basically I do six because I have my marketing agency and then I still am a freelance for a company, so I'll do like three and three. Um, so like a networking event would be one. Mm. So like, or like would a doctor's appointment be one as well, or is it just like tasks, like, like define three tasks? Like so what are some examples? So the question was define three examples of tasks. Yeah. Okay. And the three things are three things to deal wholly with the business. That's it. Right? Anything beyond those three things, doctor's appointment, going to get a massage at the spa, go crazy. Right? Just get those three things done. Right? And if we go back to the Agile model, what am I doing? What did I do yesterday? What am I doing today? What's in my way? I can measure the speed and the direction of the company based on what they tell me in this meeting. Now, again, I have a hard rule. Three things. What are your three things that you're going to get done, that you're going to guarantee me that you're going to get done today? If you get those three things done, good. Bonus is for you. If you don't get those three things done, how come? What got stuck? We got a question over here first. So the question is, is there a reset in the top threes? And um, hu like, so adults, humans, can only focus on any given particular task for a maximum of two hours. Okay. So after a two-hour stint of anything, if you get your, your three things done within that two-hour stint, stop, take a break. 15 minutes, stretch, walk, exercise, play with the dog, whatever it is, check your Facebook. 15 minutes, take a break, then you can come back again. If you want to go for another, if you want to go for another three, go for it. Again, two hour windows maximum. Okay, you can't focus on anything deeper than that. And maximum, three of those two hour windows. That's all you're gonna get, right? If you can get three two hours, three solid two hour windows of yourself in a day, give yourself a pat on the back. Try not to keep doing that day in day out. You might die. Okay, most CEOs of the most powerful companies in the world are stupid, ridiculously happy if they can get two solid hours in a day. Two solid hours. These are the top CEOs in the world. Another question. It sounds like you need to break the projects down into tasks that are doable. Absolutely. So that you can do three tasks in a day. You bet. Okay. Absolutely. So the question was, you have to break your projects down into bite-sized tasks. And the answer is yes. When you go through the Scrum training series, it'll actually walk you through how to break things down into bite-sized tasks, such that you can check to see, hey, are we doing it right? Are we doing it right? Are we doing it right? Okay. And don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to screw up. But you're only screwing up a small bite-sized task. Then you can see, are they going the right direction or not? You only got three things. How come? Well, three things. The most you can be wrong is three steps in the wrong direction. Now you can adjust, fix, and go again. If you don't talk to them within that scrum period, which is usually two weeks, the, the most you're off course is two weeks. Could you imagine how terrible it would be if you didn't talk to them for six months? That's terrifying. Okay, what did I just pay you for? You have no idea. Okay, so top three, scaling and sanity checks. This is what keeps you okay at the end of the day. right? This is what keeps you going. This is what keeps your business running. My mentors beat me up around consistency and being able to stay the long game. Okay? Anybody can play the short game. 
But in your flash in the pan, you burn out. What use, what use are you after that? You're done. Okay. You can also do irreversible damage to your brain if you keep doing more than three things. If you keep, so that, uh, that, that chemical compound, I can't remember what it was, but it, look it up in my LinkedIn. But if you keep depleting that to zero all the time over and over and over again, you can do irreversible damage to your brain. Okay, so I think I screwed myself up because when I was younger, I'm like, yeah, let's do 20 things. And then now it's like, oh, I don't want to do 20 things anymore, right? So stick to three, consistent, keep that going. Keep that through your organization. Then it's easy to see if people are doing the right thing or not. Any other questions? These are good questions. Okay, <coughs> moving on. Possibilities. Here's where I am now. Okay, I'm, I'm running a seven-figure, you know, marketing company. My, my mentors are pushing me to eight figures. How come? It's a fully outsourced delivery team. Earl is responsible for nothing. That is wonderful. Okay? It's the most freeing thing in the world. Okay? I don't have to deliver anything. My job is just to make sure everyone keeps going. Okay? What's your top three? That's my question for everybody. They know. They see me. Uh oh, he's going to ask me what my top three is. I better know what those are. Right? I only have to focus on sales and marketing. That's it. And I chose to do that. Those are the two things I actually enjoy doing. I like doing sales. I like doing marketing. It's fun for me. Right? I wake up in the morning stretch and go, yeah, let's do some marketing because it's fun. Okay. How come? I went through my entire schedule. I time blocked everything. What do I like doing? What do I not like doing? If I don't like doing it, guess what? I'm not doing it anymore. Okay. The first things to go were the things that I was the best at, but I hated. How come? Those are the easiest manuals to make. The prize you get for writing a good manual is you never have to do that task ever again. The punishment you get for not writing a manual is guess who has to do the task again. The punishment you get for writing a crap manual, guess who has to do the task again, or has to re-explain it again. I'm not going to lie to you guys. It takes three, four, five, sometimes ten times as long to write this manual than just to do it yourself. But the problem is, if you never do this, you always have to do it yourself. So what are the things that you could do away with? Question. What's, what's the difference between a standard operating procedures and a manual? It's just semantics. So the question was, what's the difference between a standard operational procedure and a manual? Uh, some people are going to tell you that uh, an SOP, Standard Operational Procedure, uh, is more detailed than the manual. They've got step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step instructions. Manuals sometimes are just big, wavy movements in the right direction, right? Um, I always err to making sure that I'm trying to cater to a five-year-old. If I can, I actually legitimately, I used to have a five-year-old. So he's 11 now, so I can't really use him as much. But uh, so when he was five, I would, here, son, learn how to do this. And he would go through the things and click through it. And if he could do it, I wrote a good manual. If he couldn't do it, he, he got stuck on step, I would revisit that step. And I would literally ask my kids, hey, can you help daddy with this? And then they would go through it. And if they couldn't click through and they didn't know which button to push or what to type in next, I failed. If they could do it, the outsourcer can do it. So back to that question of trust. Who should you trust? Nobody. Trust you. Write the manual well. And don't be afraid. If you screw it up, the feedback you get when you hire three, test three, keep one is going to be there. If you guys keep getting the same question over and over and over again from your staff, rewrite that part of the manual. Yes. Fantastic question. So the question was, what are your thoughts on recording stuff th with video as opposed to with hard copy? So it's actually an excellent thing to do. I do that as well. So I actually do everything uh, both. So I do the steps in a video format, and then I break it down into a manual afterwards. How come? Sometimes, in some countries, tornado hits, typhoon hits, hurricane hits, internet goes down. It's not, the internet isn't as fast anymore. You know, telephone poles fall over. Stuff happens. Okay? The infrastructure isn't as good as the infrastructure here. One telephone there uh, knocks over. There's 17 villages without power. 
If one of those villages happens to have your outsourcer in it, well, you're SOL, right? That's why we do it the way we do it. We, we actually write the manuals just in case everything breaks and their internet goes really slow. They can still be useful. They can still be working. Right? Uh, I used to actually only do videos until this happened to me. Then I'm like, oh, well, that's not good. And then now it's like, no, no, there's always a manual now. <laughs> and the beautiful thing is, as you get better at this, I don't write manuals anymore. I just make the video, send it to my outsourcing team, they write the manual. Then, guess what? Hey, hire yourself an assistant. You know you're doing well when your assistant has an assistant. Anyway, so what happens is that when your assistant has an assistant, they're training them, they're writing the manuals. Hey, how many questions did your assistant ask you today? Oh, you can see the level of their manual. You can see the level of their standard operational procedure based on how much time are they spending babysitting, right? And if they can write a better manual, then you don't have to. Then your business gets to grow. Okay. And again, your assistant hires an assistant, then you have a happy day. Okay. Any other questions? Question in the back. No, I've been in business like 40 years, and, and I've got so many departments that I don't have manuals for. Like I don't have a manual for the, um, you know, for the whole factory. I mean, there's, there's procedures for formulations and things, but there's, there's um, you know, I used, to, I used to be, I'm a pharmacist, I used to do some of the, the, the batching like 40 years ago. I don't do it anymore. I can't do everything. So, and then I have an accountant guy who does all the accounting, and I don't have a manual for everything. He does in QuickBooks, all the invoicing, and all the stuff. If he leaves tomorrow, I've got a big problem. Yep. I have a, the batcher, I've got a problem. So, how do I engage them to, to create a manual and, and, and not fear losing their jobs? You know, like a, every, everyone should have passwords, should be written down. So the question is, you've been working for 40 years, there's a bunch of departments that don't have any manuals, how do I get started? Um, there's, no, there's no shortcut, there's no magic wand, there's no nothing, it's just get started. Right? Start making the manual. And depending on the, this is, this is using a little bit of evil psychology, uh, depending on the nature of the people who are running that shop, right? typically people who are accountants, bookkeepers, that sort of thing, they're a bit in the analytical perfectionist type uh, people, so write a horrible manual and let them fix it kind of hilarious. Make, just make a bunch of mistakes, like, no, 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 I'll do it for you, and then they do it. It's great. Yeah, so anything where you're dealing with perfectionists or people who are computer programmers, uh, accountants, number cruncher people, people who look at spreadsheets all day, yeah, just make a really bad manual, like you're dumb, and then go, hey, 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 hey here's the manual, and then all of a sudden they're like, no, no, that's really bad, and then they make a better one. It, it, it's fun. So, and then the question is, you know, where do you start? Throw a dart, pick one. Which one's the most pain in your butt? Right? Pick the one that hurts the most. Get it done. Can you, can you ask them to say, okay, you, I mean, they haven't got time for it all, to say, you know, write down how you do an invoice. You know, they're going to say, um, you know, I've got to, I've got to be invoicing. Yeah. So the question was, they don't have time to do it. My answer is, give them time to do it. That's really it. People will, people will go to whatever they're, they're incentivized to do. Great, this is your bonus for this quarter. It's based on whether or not your department is, uh, is all uh, standard operational procedure and manualed up or not. Okay. One of the things by, by which I measure the, the strength of a business, and this is horrible and I can't believe I'm saying this on camera, but uh, it's called the bus factor. <laughs> and the bus factor is how many people in your company does it take to get hit by a bus before it comes to a grinding stop? If the answer is one, you have failed miserably. Okay. So if one person gets hit by a bus and the whole company dies, you're doing it wrong, okay? Is there a manual to replace that person? No, well, damn. Okay, uh, if they ask the question, am I gonna lose my job? The answer is no, unless, it's, unless you're actually gonna lose your job, then, then maybe not tell them until they're after that manual. But, uh, but, you know, build these things and just tell them, hey guys, a consultant came in and he said bus factor. And he said, yeah, <laughs> if any of you guys are gone, what happens? Great, everybody dies. Do you want that? No. Is this to replace you? No, it's to hire you an assistant. Does that sound good? Yes, that sounds good. Would you like some more help with your job? Yeah, I want some help with my job. Hey, you want an assistant? Yeah, I do. Great, we're outsourcing it. They get to do all the stuff that you don't like to do anymore. You can just focus on the stuff that we need you for. Great. You already complained that you don't have enough time in your day. You already complained that I can't be writing a manual on invoicing. I'm too busy invoicing then you're doing it wrong, okay? 
questions on that? It's a good question. Different question. Different question. Do you recommend Upwork or other places to hire? So the question was, do I, up, do I, do I recommend Upwork or other places to hire? Uh, I've used all of them. I've used all of them, right? And the, the key to success, again, is, is hiring the right type of people. So hiring Bs. So when you write your job descriptions for Upwork, when you write your, you know, just everything, you attract the B type people. Write it as though you're trying to literally bring a B to honey, okay? Uh, for lack of better terms, sorry, Shakespeare guy. Anyway, so uh, so yeah, that that's that's really it. If you if you're if you're writing it to attract the right type of people, okay. One of the things I do for um, my mentees, and then this is because uh, I mentor people as well, is uh, I'm gonna step off camera for one quick second. I'll grab this, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna throw something at you, and I want you to catch it, okay. On the count of three, one, two, three. How's she supposed to catch it? The throw was terrible. Right? How she's supposed to, she can't. The answer is she's never gonna catch it. That's my manual. If my manual is bad, then I can't blame the employee. I can't blame my team member for not being able to execute. Right? I take responsibility for that. If the manual has, if you have questions, how come you threw it that way? <laughs> Why didn't you throw it this way? Right? The more questions that you ask, I have to address those questions of myself. And that's, that's how I hire and get better at hiring and just become a better leader and become a better manager, right? I, I throw everything, you know, it, it, everything is, it starts and ends with you, right? So it, it's, that, it's that piece that uh, you kind of have to own that, so. And do you try like things like Fiverr versus Upwork? Definitely. So the question was, I've tried Fiverr versus Upwork. Yeah, some people at Fiverr are better than people at Upwork. Again, it's the right type of people. Hire the right person for the job and you're gonna get success. Hire the wrong person for the job, doesn't matter where you hire them from. So it, is, so it is important to actually interview them on face to face or can you hire them just to without? Um, so the, the question was, can you hire them without interviewing them face to face? And the answer is it depends. If it's for one simple job, like my thing on YouTube, do I really need to interview that guy? Not really, okay? So if it's a simple task, I don't care if I ever meet them. If it's an intricate task, or if it's a task that needs to be repeated with trust and structure, then yeah, I'm gonna interview them. Definitely interview them. Okay. Spend the time in the interview because that's what's gonna save you time later. Right. If you do a really good job at interviewing, you'll save a bunch of time later. Is that right? Any other questions? Concerns? Go on once. Some of the challenges like when you start bringing in this three hundred. Yes. Obviously, you start with one, and you end up 300 in other businesses. Right. Uh, what are the, some of the challenges, and how did you overcome them? So the question was, what are the challenges I had to overcome to get a team of 300? Um, and so you're absolutely right. You start with one, right? Um, the challenges were, I write manuals for myself, right? It's just enough for me to remember how to get the job done. That's not good enough. The level of the manual must be that I can give it to an absolute stranger and they can get the job done. So that was the first hurdle, getting over myself, right? I get it, why don't you get it? Okay. That's also the cardinal sin of marketing, right? You don't write marketing for yourself. If I read that, I wouldn't buy that. Who cares? Are you the target market? No, then guess what? Nobody cares, right? Show it to the target market. If they buy, good. Then your marketing is good, okay? So same, same kind of structure, right? So, and how do you, how do you scale and how do you grow? It's the same answer as how do you eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time, right? Pick one department that you want to grow and get, get, get excellent in uh, and measure yourself based on the amount of time you spend in that department, okay? The more time you spend in that department, you're failing. The less time you spend in that department, you're doing well, okay? Learn to delegate and delegation is, is an absolute key thing. Uh, it took my accountant several, several sessions to beat me into delegation, okay? I was a perfectionist. I liked everything my way or is wrong, da da da. You just gotta get over that. And that, that took me a long time to get over, okay? It was the 80% um, the is good enough. If you can find someone who can do anything 80% of what you can do, keep them and hold them forever, <laughs> okay? So, because you can train the other 20%. 
or if they just can't get that other 20%, you can train someone else to do that 20%. And that person just does the 80 and then someone finishes it. Okay? A real life example for this would be in sales. Okay? Opening the door and getting people to listen to you is one whole skill set. Closing the deal and getting people to give you money is another whole skill set. Do not make those things mix. Do not judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree. Okay? Otherwise, every fish thinks it's dumb. Okay? I have this one guy, excellent, excellent door opener. Even he has no idea how he's so good at opening doors. But you ask him to close just one, and he's the fish who can't climb a tree. Okay? You give the closing job to the closers, you give the opening job to the openers. And you base their bonuses and their pay based on their ability to execute that one specific job. That's not a good trick. Only hire the outsourcer for one thing. You guys have seen that meme, you only had one job? Yeah. You only had one job. Do this. Okay. So only outsource things where you have enough work for someone to do. Guys, everyone here in this room has something they don't like to do. Okay. Who likes tax time? I didn't see any hands go up. <laughs> no one likes tax time. Except the accountants, then they get rich, right? So no one likes tax time. Well, guess who likes, who actually likes compiling receipts and going food, food, food. Ooh, that's why I'm so, you know, you know. <laughs> okay. No one likes doing that. No one likes, no one likes putting that stuff together. Okay. There's stuff that you guys do in the day that you don't enjoy doing. Stop it. Are you worth more than 375 an hour? Probably. Get someone else to do that. What could you do, be doing more with your time? that you could be making more money with, right? It's just, it's just a game of efficiencies, okay? If I'm in a client meeting and I get that client to come on board, that could be worth three, four, five, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month for the company. Should I be checking my email? Nope. My team checks it, finds the client lists, puts those in my important pile, and I'll read the important pile. If there's more time later, I read the other ones. If there's more time later, I clean my spam box and go, no, oh, no, that's actually not spam. Okay. It's, a, it's a game of really just prioritization. If you can win the prioritization game, you win the business game. That's all it is. Okay. So that being said, comes to the end of the presentation, and it's the offer. So the offer, um, this is for all of you in YouTube land as well. Um, it's a structure and best practices manual. It's called the Entrepreneur's Guide to Outsourcing. How to list a sample of what an SOP looks like, examples, reporting structures, uh, project management structures, the complete collection on basically what you need to start outsourcing. Okay, we started putting this thing together kind of as a best practice for ourselves. Okay, and so that's on the market for 20 bucks. You guys want it? I'm not gonna do the whole American thing. It's worth $2,000 and then all the way down to 20 bucks. No, it's just <laughs> We're Canadian here. It's 20 bucks, it's 20 bucks. Okay. You want one? Let me know. Here's my email address. If you're interested, email me. Earl at mindofamarketer.net. And I'll give it to you. I mean, this this is the stuff that I had to bleed for. So if you guys want it, it's yours for 20 bucks. I think I'm giving it away for a steal. That's that's cool. Uh, you guys can learn all the mistakes I made when I did this and kind of go from there. And that is all I have for today. That is wonderful. Share the same box today. <clears throat> Earl, uh, some of the ways you look at things uh, are absolutely unique. I, I, Thanks. I have never heard of a pile of this stuff. It's all classic Earl Formata. Oh, thank you. Well done. You enjoy yourself. You learn lots. Yes. Yeah, you, you now know what to do, your next step. Give him 20 bucks and earn <laughs> and, 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 and get his operating manual as to how to arts, outsource. Right. Well done. I'm just going to, oh, no, you have to do it. Oh, I have to do the, the you, last you piece? To oh, but you can trim, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. So, so you I, now, I unconnect. You, you just, I unconnect. I unconnect. You made this possible. Thank you so much for your support. It is really, really appreciated because now what we can do is take this video, share Earl's knowledge with the world, and let entrepreneurs around the world build better businesses and otherwise they might not be able to afford or have access to this kind of knowledge. So Ion Connect, you rock. Yay.